Tell us about how you became an Arizona Diamondback because, uh, you know, we last remember you at the Blue Jays. I think a lot of people were, were thinking you would go where R.A. went. Uh, it didn't work out that way for you. You were with the Diamondbacks last year, but uh, things didn't go as well as you were hoping, did they? Yeah, right. So um, last year I got an offer uh, right after the Braves signed uh, R.A., and it was just something I wasn't willing to jump at in November. And um, I just kind of wrote it out all the way, and then we had, we had passed on the deal by the Braves, and nothing kind of came of it until about mid-January. I had a, a couple offers from some teams, and – um, I got on the phone with Jared Porter, who's the assistant GM with the Diamondbacks, and I just had a real, uh, you know, it was like kind of a gut instinct. It was not my best shot to get back to the big leagues by no means. Take us back through how you became such a knuckleball expert. I can't imagine that uh, going to college and Little League before that, you would go up to Dad and say, Dad, uh, my dream is to become a, a guy who's a knuckleball specialist catcher. How did that evolve for you? I was kind of the young prospect catcher coming up with the Mets. Spring training starts. They sign this guy, R.A. Dickey. Really, other than that, he throws knuckleballs. Nobody really knows. I mean, knew that he was a journeyman around the minor leagues. A couple, you know, some time in the big leagues, but nothing really of that. I didn't, I didn't know much more than that. And they called me in the office. They said, listen, unless uh, somebody gets hurt in camp, you're going to start in AAA, and we want you to play every day. They said, here's kind of the caveat to this. We want you to play every day, but we're going to send a knuckleballer there. So how do you feel comfortable about learning how to catch the knuckleball? So I, I said, yeah, of course. I could, I'm not going to lose out on a day of playing because I can't catch a guy, right? Right. And I just followed R.A. around for pretty much all of spring training, caught all of his starts, all of his bullpens, and I just, you know, it, it just kind of landed that way. And, um. And we just became comfortable over the years with each other. So that was um, that was essentially how, how it got started. We had J.P. Aaron Sebia on our show this summer, and we asked him, who is the toughest pitcher you've ever had to catch? And without blinking an eye, he said, R.A. Dickey. And when we said, what is it like? He said, it's, it's like a butterfly coming at you. Uh, you're, you're a guy who perfected it as much as anyone can possibly perfect it. How tough is that pitch, and, and how long did it take before you went, oh, man, this is just ridiculous. I have no idea what's happening here. The old adage that the best way to catch a knuckleball is wait for it to stop rolling and pick it up. It's an art that you don't really perfect, I will say this. I mean, you know, there's going to be – you're going to have bad days. I mean, Barry, you sat you sat in the, the well right by the dugout when R.A. was pitching, and how many times you just hear the fans just riding you, like, oh, let's go, catch the ball, totally, like – they, those days happen more than the other way, you know, just because it is a it's a challenging it's a challenging task every day because what he does in the bullpen doesn't necessarily translate to what's going to happen during the game. Yeah. So you can't be like first inning go. Oh, yeah. I mean, you could say there's a lot of movement, but you can't tell whether or not, you know, he's going to go eight scoreless innings because he would be the kind of guy. And I guess this goes with any knuckleballer. He could pitch three perfect innings and then give up a four spot in the fourth inning with, you know, a walk and a couple of home runs. Yeah, and you're and you know you're exactly right. I mean it it it, it can change on a dime in any direction on you. You've got to have the chemistry with them behind the plate. But off the field, we know R.A. was, let's call him a different kind of dude. We know he loves Star Wars and all. But was there was he the type of guy that you had to develop a really close bond with off the field as well? Or, or was this one of those things where you were cordial, but this was a, an on-field relationship? No, it was, I mean, strictly on-field. I mean, it, you know, R.A. RA was older. He had older kids. You know, he just kind of stayed to himself. And, you know, different personalities for sure. But, um it, it, it didn't hinder what we were able to do on the field. I will, I will say that. And I will give you credit, Mr. Tolley. You, uh, because of your relationship with R.A. Dickey, convinced Mr. Dickey to do a television interview with me uh, a couple of years back because I, right. had, I had said to you, Josh, what's up with your man R.A.? He, he'll only do interviews with you know the big wigs that come in from New York. And you said, oh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Next thing you know, R.A. looks at me and says, what are you doing telling Josh I only talk to big wigs for? I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, he did the interview, hey, right? I'll get, you, I'll get you the interview, but I got to tell it how it is. Well, sometimes right. the truth is the best way to go. Yes, it is. I know you're not a social media guy, but 
were you aware of, you know, when people would, fans, certain fans would get on you because it's like, why isn't Josh totally hitting 300 as a, as a backup catcher who plays once every five days? Were these things that you were completely immune to, or am I am I breaking this to you for the first time in your life? No, I, <laughs> I am I, I am so immune to it; it doesn't bother me. I mean, getting you get booed by fifty thousand people. That's one thing I always say is I like stuff like that doesn't rattle me. I've um, I got rattled one time in my career, and that was when I was playing in New York, and I just had a guy actually after my wife, and I that was the end of it, and the. Yeah. Um, the people, the security people at the Mets squashed it. But after that, I don't read anything. I don't, I don't, you know, or if, even if I do read it, I, I take it all with a grain of salt because I understand that's part of, that's part of the job. 